Lightning barely strikes twice for me with games, and in my case, it rarely strikes as hard and fast as the original No More Heroes did. Its quirky, over-the-top story was matched by extraordinarily fun gameplay that was simple at first but involved deliberately planning attacks against the legion of memorable bosses in the game. Because of that, it quickly became some of the most fun I had in 2020, and when a game makes that big of a boom when it drops in, it adds an obscene amount of pressure to a sequel and creates expectations to match that level of quality, whether it's possible or not. Like I did with the first game, I went into Desperate Struggle as obliviously as possible, but after researching the game for the last video, I naturally ran into some articles and reviews for the sequel. I tried to avoid all the details like the bosses and the story, while also getting a gauge of what reviewers thought of it. It seemed pretty polarizing among reviewers and fans, likely because of the back seat that Suda51 took. He was still involved, but it wasn't nearly as in control as before, and that was a little bit worrying for me. But undeterred, I set forth back into Santa Destroy once more to check in on what Travis Touchdown has been up to since the last game. Before you start your desperate struggling, you should drop a nice save. When I started No More Heroes 2, it felt like something was keeping me from being as hooked as much as I was with the first game, likely due to how different this game is from its predecessor. At its core, the familiar combat returns and it's just as chaotic as ever, if not more so, but also everything surrounding the combat is different in substantial ways. The cold, empty, open world of Santa Destroy is replaced by a map of waypoints you select to travel to. The hot and cold part-time jobs mandatory for progressing the story in the first game were replaced by full-on NES-style minigames with multiple levels in each. The most notable change in my opinion is the removal of entry fees that were previously required to progress the story and challenge opponents. Now you can just go to the next battle as soon as you like. And I'll get into why all of these changes might be good or bad in just a bit, but first we have to talk about the plot hole ridden story. And I've put myself in the radical position of trying to avoid spoilers from the first game, making the bridge from the first game to the second pretty tough to talk about. So we're gonna see how I pull this off. No More Heroes 2 picks up three years after the events of the first game. After becoming the number one ranked assassin in No More Heroes 1, hardly a spoiler, what did you think was gonna happen? Travis walked away from the life of being an assassin. In his absence, he's become something of a celebrity because now, and here's where the plot hole is for the fans of the original game, the UAA assassin battles are now televised as some kind of reality TV spectator sporting event. And while plenty of assassins are there to fill the void, Travis leaves his number one spot, the true reason he rises to fame. Not because he made it to the top spot, but because he had the power to vacate it and disappear. His legend status is built off of his secret on how to leave it all behind. And this secret earns him the title of the No More Hero and the Crownless King. But now Travis has returned to a very different Santa Destroy, one that is highly corporatized and developed. The stage is set once again on the rooftop where our original story began all those years ago, fighting the brother of the assassin that Travis first killed that set him on this path in the first place. Skelter Helter, the brother of Helter Skelter, is out for revenge on Travis for killing his brother. Naturally a battle ensues and once Travis defeats him, Skelter Helter warns Travis that this battle is just the beginning, and at this very moment an orchestrated team is arriving at Beefhead, the video store near Travis's motel, to kill Bishop. Travis's best friend. A story of revenge is born out of someone else's revenge on Travis. The new goal is to make the people who killed Bishop pay, but in order to get to the director of Bishop's assassination, Travis must once again fight through the ranks of assassins to get to number one and face Pizza Bat CEO Jasper Bat Jr. Oh my god, it's a Batman reference. Why did I just get that? We know Skelter Helter wanted revenge for his brother, but why is Jasper out for vengeance at all? Travis killed his family too, hilariously enough in the first assassination mission in the first No More Heroes. One of the faceless, nameless targets you killed sets off the events of the second game, and I love that. Because not only is it hilarious, but it carries meaning too. The point is, that mission which had no implications for Travis had lasting repercussions for someone else. And if you pinch to zoom out a little bit, with the amount of bloodshed in the first game, you can start to imagine the lasting repercussions and endless possibilities Travis created in his first adventure. It's very grim, and the art style in No More Heroes 2 also matches that feeling. 
The colors are dulled a bit and the blood and gore feels even grittier this time around, like the rage flowing through Travis matches the blood spray. We also have a very different Travis this time around too. He's still a pervy dude we know from the last game who still wants Sylvia to sleep with him, but our protagonist is more somber, focused, and somehow more empathetic in spite of all that. We can obviously credit his somber tone and focus to avenging Bishop's death, but his empathy, I feel, is a result of personality growth since the credits rolled in the last game. Travis took the subliminal warnings from his opponents in the first game about how cyclical violence would ruin his life, making it impossible for him to rest without losing what makes him human. He was young and inexperienced in the first game, but now he's more grizzled and hardened. He carries himself with the weight of the lives he took now, and when you compare him to his previous outing, he looks more along the lines of one of the burned out assassins he killed than he does himself. I wouldn't say he's ready to die like death metal from the first game, but the thrill Travis gets when he kills is gone, replaced with the cravings for good fights. More so, the killing is a necessary evil to get us to Jasper Bat Jr. This is the core of the secret that makes Travis so envied. The concept is totally lost on the assassins Travis meets in the sequel because they're so embroiled in the fame and bloodlust that the only true reward for them is more and more. They can't possibly begin to understand how Travis quit. And in No More Heroes 2, we see Travis try to spare almost as many enemies as he's required to kill. And I think Travis's character arc is really what kept me excited this time around, even though I didn't find the gameplay as gripping as the first go round. Combat is once again the centerpiece of No More Heroes 2 Desperate Struggle. In some ways, the combat feels worse though. I didn't feel like the high and low attacks were nearly as substantial or made as big of a difference as they did in the first game, and as such, it feels less involved and less strategic and a lot more button mashy. The motion controls also felt less responsive this time around too, which was something I praised pretty highly in the first game, so it was pretty apparent here that it wasn't as responsive. But that said, that's about as far as my complaints go. Do these issues get in the way of the fun? A bit. I don't think it wholly ruins the experience, but it does feel worse sometimes. But the strides and new quality of life changes in the gameplay also help bring the fun back. Wrestling moves return and the RNG super moves are as wild and cool as ever. Additionally, Travis has a new mechanic up his sleeve too. His ecstasy meter at the bottom of the screen that appears as a tiger fills up as he chains together combos. When the tiger roars, Travis can morph into a tiger himself and claw enemies to death in one swipe as they try to run away. It's satisfying and funny and happens infrequently enough that it feels rewarding every time. The combat can also feel more varied as you can switch between beam katanas at will, and this is a huge deal. In the first game, most of the beam katanas felt like incremental upgrades on the base katana. In the sequel though, most of them feel drastically different. The blood berry returns, but it's the weakest in the game. If you save up some money, you can get an upgrade pretty easily though. But here is where things get interesting. The peony is a broadsword style beam katana that's slow and heavy but packs a huge punch. The blade also elongates as the ecstasy meter increases. I found it especially helpful when taking out big guys and it clears out rooms quick. Thoreau's Nasty is actually two dual-wielded katanas that do weaker attacks but are lightning quick and you can land tons of hits with them. The Tsubaki Mark III from the first game also returns. With so much variety, it was fun to experiment with different katanas on different enemies to see what worked. I think above all else, my biggest problem with the combat as a whole was just how long and how many waves of enemies lasted without having gameplay novelties and gimmicks like the first game to break up the tedium. It was rare, but there were times when I really wished the waves upon waves of enemies would just stop. There were too many instances where you'd be in a parking lot or hall and enemies would have to be slain before the game would let you continue. And while the enemies were varied most of the time, occasionally I was just like, enough already! Luckily, when things got repetitive, we had the time to earn money, buy clothes, and train. The side jobs in the first game were pretty polarizing, and I landed on the side of being fine with them as a part of the story, while also avoiding the ones I didn't care for. But the side job minigames in Desperate Struggle are a hugely welcome addition. Most of them are great. I would love a fully expanded version of the Lay the Pipe minigame, and was bummed that there were only four different levels that would repeat every time you played it. There was only one I despised, and it involved collecting trash in space. All in all, they were fun diversions that provided fun gameplay in between boss fights. But No More Heroes 2 has a money problem in that you kind of have to convince yourself to bother with it. 
Now that entry fees are gone, you can brute force your way through a lot of the game without worrying about earning money to train. Your only true incentives to earn money at the beginning of the game come from buying beam katanas from Naomi. The lack of emphasis on money and entry fees creates a serious pacing problem in my eyes. In the first game, League battles felt earned. You have to save your cash so Travis could have another battle. In No More Heroes 2, there's no anticipation or buildup because you can just do most of the fights back to back without anything stopping you. And because the game throws fights at you so quickly, I accidentally discovered you can just completely miss a boss fight and the revenge missions where you track down Bishop's killers if you just don't go back to his apartment for any reason. These revenge missions replace the assassin for higher missions from the first game and theoretically help Travis get closer to the murder squad who killed Bishop. But in practice, you're just killing more and more enemies or killing a specific target. There are 10 of these missions, but there is no cutscene or circumstance for beating them. It feels very overlooked in that part of the game. Compared to the first game, it feels like you experience what the sequel brings to the table in light speed. It feels really hard to slow down and savor it because it removes the need for exploration and the grind for more money. Instead, it feels like you're just being hurtled toward the next battle. Too much of a good thing. But how are the actual boss battles you're being flung at? I've been going back and forth on this since I started the game, and I think it's smarter and more effective to look at the quality of opponent individually over them all as a whole, because I liked some of them, and I didn't care for others. In No More Heroes 1, most of the bosses served a greater meaning for Travis. They were all horribly flawed and damaged for their lifestyle. But the bosses in Desperate Struggle are more individually focused, walking the line between homage and parody. The boss fights in No More Heroes 2 are even more over the top than they were in the first game. The bosses in No More Heroes 1 were all basically human beings similar in size to Travis, and that helped play into exhibiting their lost humanity, showing how they looked like people but were basically just shells of a person. But enemies in Desperate Struggle have this larger-than-life tendency. Very early on in the game, when Travis is still ranked 51 on the UAA list, he fights with football star Charlie McDonald and his army of cheerleaders who all pilot a single mech suit that's larger than a skyscraper. And when Travis fights him in a mech suit of his own, to me it signifies the larger-than-life pedestals we put stars on while simultaneously putting on display how the battles of the rich and powerful wage war and destruction on the unknowing people below. Charlie is open about his admiration for Travis early on, and this event is a spat between those two alone. Yet they're dragging the entire city into this with no doubt millions of dollars in property damage they won't be held accountable for. Other bosses are less about making a statement, and some are just more about celebrating pop culture. Like there's an entire lead up in boss fight that tips its hat to Resident Evil 4, chainsaws and ominous wooden houses and all. There's also a literal General Grievous from Star Wars. It's pretty freaking awesome. And while I like the character designs and their tongue-in-cheek homages to other things, I was less blown away by the actual fight structures themselves. A lot of the fights felt very similar to one another, boiling down to waiting until an opponent misses you and swinging your blade at them. And of course, the first game had its fair share of this too, but usually bosses had gimmicks that required you to change up your strategy. There was a lot less of that this time around, and I only died a handful of times throughout my entire playthrough as opposed to the countless times I got stuck in the first game due to lack of figuring out the right strategy. In No More Heroes 2, there isn't as much variety and the high-speed pacing also really puts that on display. If it seems like I didn't enjoy No More Heroes 2, I can assure you I did. But going back to the impression the first game made, I was left disappointed by the sequel. It's not a bad game in the slightest, and in a lot of ways it makes improvements over the original like in the Ecstasy Meter and the part-time job minigames. But in other ways it just feels rushed, especially in its pacing from start to finish, and the seemingly forgotten about revenge missions that the story sets up to be hugely important and then does nothing with. The missing open world also doesn't help visualize the changes in Santa Destroy on a world-building level. The only way we know the city is being overwhelmingly run by the Pizza Bat Corporation is in its brief mention in the intro and passive aggressively by the guy who hires you to do part-time work. The menu you select missions from and places to go is set over a white model of the city that doesn't really show much of anything. Had it been a fast travel system added on top of an open world, it would have worked better, but we can only take it for what it is. It feels even emptier than the original open world, and it feels less deliberate this way. When all is said and done, I still had a pretty good time with No More Heroes 2 in spite of my many qualms with it, which says a lot given how different of a direction this game took. Even though it's not as good, I still feel like its strength was still combat, the writing, and the story. And those three things make it worth playing in my opinion. 
Our newly sympathetic Travis shows growth, and now I'm excited to see where the character goes from here into No More Heroes 3. Thank you so much for watching this far into the video. I really appreciate you making it to the end. If you liked the video, please leave a like on it. It helps me out more than you realize. If you played No More Heroes 2, what did you think of it? Let me know in the comments down below. And I'm also starting a Patreon. Uh, for only $1 a month, you can get access to all my scripts and a couple of videos on what my method is when I'm making videos. Obviously, everybody's gonna have a different method, but a lot of people ask me about what my method is like, how I write videos, different things like that. So for $1 a month, you can get access to all of my scripts. And there's a few other tiers there as well if you wanna check them out. And lastly, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing. I'd really appreciate it. I'm posting videos all the time. So if you never wanna miss one, please hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon to make sure you never miss when I upload. But wait, isn't there something I'm forgetting about?